Good morning and welcome to Missoula Real Estate Today. This is Peter Christian. I'm here with the host of the show, Diane Beck, with Windermere Real Estate. Diane has been helping buyers and sellers with real estate in the Missoula area for over 20 years and is very active in the Missoula community. Along with their trusted partners, Diane provides complete service for your real estate transaction. And now, Missoula Real Estate Today on Newstalk KGBO.com. 98.3 FM and 1290 AM. And uh, we have kind of a biannual visit here today. Our our dear friend and one of the most popular folks uh, here on Missoula Real Estate today is Bill Karras with Karras Nursery and Landscape. Bill, it's always a pleasure to see you. It's nice to be here on a nice rainy little yeah. October morning. <laughs> it is kind of raining out there, isn't it? Yeah. At, at least yeah. right now. It will be off and on through yes, the month. Yes. That's just and of October course, October is. There's some snow up in the mountains already. Yeah, we like that. We want to get some snowpack going. You bet. So, so anyway, uh, for for those of you, uh, we we have Bill on it like twice a year, mm-hmm. and uh, but for those who maybe just joined us for the first time, uh, I always like to lay the groundwork a little bit. I can't just assume everybody knows about Bill Karras and Karras Nursery and Landscape. So, if you wouldn't mind just giving us a brief capsule history of uh, your family business, because it's been in the business for a long time, and uh, a little bit about your background. Okay, well, um, we've been in the same location since the late 1800s. It's only been in my family since 1920, but uh, that's plenty long, I would say. (laughs) I would guess so. Uh, My grandfather uh, bought that ground, and it was an existing nursery that had gone bankrupt, and then my dad ran it, and then uh, I came along, and this is my 41st year. So I've been at it a long time. I kind of grew up in the business. I went away to college. That was it, though. I came back home and and uh, made a kind of rash decision to jump into the family uh, business. So and, may, uh, may I ask, what, what was your degree? I actually got a degree in biology from the University of Oregon. Well, there but you I, go. I was born in Missoula and sure. raised in Missoula, and then I just went away. But uh, uh, the biology helped, although at Oregon they really they concentrate on uh, molecular biology and biochemistry and all those things. So, wow, yeah. So it wasn't like I was learning about trees and shrubs, but I've had so, plenty so, of time since. <laughs> so you could have been, you could have been a cancer scientist or something like that. Well, right? I could have been. I, yeah. I was yeah. actually uh, researching lipids as a lab technician when I decided to come back home. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, <laughs> good to have you here. I'm glad you did because who knows what would have happened if uh, if you weren't there to take yeah. take the reins over at uh, Karis Nursery We'd be Atlantic. talking about lipids. <laughs> <laughs> and it would be a very short conversation. I can there pretty much guarantee that. Okay. So uh, tell us a little bit about the store. And I know that uh, uh, when spring hits, I know Mother's Day is huge for you guys and because we always get our traditional two uh, flower baskets uh, for Mother's Day. That's my my gift to mm-hmm. my wife. And this year, by the way, you would not believe how huge they are. They started out small, and they're almost down to the ground by now with uh, you well, know, trailer flowers. That means you're flowers. taking good care of them, which yes. is good. Well, uh, she, she just basically started watering them three times a day. You yeah. know, uh, hanging baskets are up in the air, and when it's warm, especially, and there's breeze, they dry out more quickly than almost right. anything else. So. Right. That's the big kicker is to stay on, not let them dry out. Once they dry out, the first thing they give up is their flowers. Right. And then it takes a while to get them back. Or if you let them go too far along, then you, you lose them and it's not worth it. Let, let, let me tell you one success story about how hardy the flowers and plants are that you that you sell. Uh, we went on vacation and I put our hanging baskets out in the, in the middle of our yard so it would get plenty of water with our regular watering. Well, the deer... Uh, jump, jump the fence and ba- practically consumed one of those uh, 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 baskets, right? And so my wife, she, she was practically in tears. I said, honey, let's just hang it up again. We'll feed it. We'll water it. And we'll see what happens. And that thing came back gangbusters. I couldn't believe sure. it. Well, sometimes it's a good idea to cut those sorts of, sorts of things back <laughs> because, uh, yeah. you know. Uh, Thank you, they, Mr. and Mrs. Whitetail. Yeah. They'll kind of go through their bloom cycle mm-hmm. and they need to be trimmed back so they can flush out again and bloom again. So you had just had some help with your gardening. Projects. We certainly did. Yeah. Unwelcome help, but help nonetheless. So, <laughs> so, so, so now, now that we've kind of talked a little bit about that, it's time to get into fall. And I know, uh, uh, yards and gardens, you don't want them to stay the same because they can't, because we have so, so many distinct seasons here. Well, I love fall. You know, uh, spring is really our season at the nursery because everybody's fired up because winter is ending and right. things are starting to bloom around town. And it's very pretty uh, in the spring. But in the fall, uh, the fall colors, I think, are spectacular. 
in Missoula anymore. We have so many varieties that we didn't used to have available that do produce nice fall color. And so Missoula is getting more and more colorful all the time. And um, so the idea of enjoying the garden clear into the fall, I think, is is something people need to think about because um, we don't want to just enjoy it for the short time or when we harvest a tomato or something. It's There's something interesting going on all the time in our garden. So is is it too late now to, to plant for fall, or do we have to plan ahead for spring and then the next fall? No, it's, a, it's still a good time to plant uh, all the way through October. A lot of particularly trees, they'll start rooting in even. And so they'll root in a little bit in the fall, root in a little bit in the spring before you ever need to water them. And so they kind of get established more easily than planting them in the spring where you have to watch them a little more closely through the summer. But anymore, since most things come in containers, you can plant almost any time. I don't particularly like planting into November uh, because we can have a hard freeze right away and and, uh, plants might get a little caught off guard. But Certainly we do a lot of, uh, uh, not a lot, we do some planting in November as well, but October is a good month. I've, I've always wanted to ask you, uh, do you ever get, are you ever taken by surprise by the change of seasons? So sometimes it happens so quickly, sometimes you just kind of ease into it? Uh, well, I mentioned earlier, this is my 41st year, so. <laughs> not many surprises. I'm not too surprised. I kind of <laughs> take whatever I get anymore. I used to, you know, in the spring especially, go, oh, I hope it's going to be nice this weekend. Right. Now I pretty much go, I, I'm going to get whatever I get this weekend. Yeah. So, so one of the, I know one of the things you wanted to talk about today was fall color and how uh, it, it's amazing how just a few additions here and there can make you want to go outside and enjoy your yard. Well, yeah, we've got so many uh, things that uh, really, I, when we started, we didn't have available that have bright orange fall color. Uh, you know, our, our university area is lined with Norway maples pretty much, and that turns yellow. And so we didn't have that that orange component as much, but now almost all the trees going in seemingly uh, have this nice fall color. And then of course there are a lot of shrubs too. We've always had burning bush. There are a lot of new shrubs that are uh, are wonderful garden additions for fall color. Then of course you can plant flowers. You can plant things like mums and asters Mm -hmm. and uh, flowering cabbage or kale in the fall to uh, replace some of your annuals if you want that kind of color. But just in terms of leaves changing color, we have so many wonderful choices now. Now, let me ask you, what, wh- which are the trees that have that glorious, bright, uh, vibrant red uh, w- when the leaves change colors? Which, which ones are those? That uh, could be a sugar maple. It could be what's called a red maple. There are a number of different varieties within that are what we call cultivars. But most of them going in are uh, autumn blaze maple or similar ones like that, which have actually been crossed by the horticultural industry between a red maple and a silver maple. So they're fast growing and hardy. But they also have that nice fall color. And that's the ones that you are seeing mostly around town. But right. the other ones I mentioned are, are really fantastic. Sure. Now, I, I'm sure that you've been watching uh, as the city of Missoula. I know we have our own city forester. We do. And, and uh, they had to take down a lot of trees in the last five or six years because they were old and falling you know, and, and, and dying, that sort of thing. How difficult is that to make that transition? I know the same thing happened at the, at the Missoula County Courthouse. Uh, they had to take all those magnificent old trees down and plant new ones. So uh, tell me about that procedure. How- well, yeah, I, I mentioned the uh, Norway maple. Uh, according to my father, he told me this story a long time ago. <laughs> they, they tried to plant sugar maples a long time ago. And most of them didn't make it, so they went to the Norway maple. And we've had a really good run out of the Norway maples. uh, But Uh, This is the city of Missoula, right? Yeah. So this is people being forward-thinking 100 years ago. And uh, so we're just trying to do that again uh, as these trees are sort of aging out, um, uh, getting replaced with a little more variety so we don't have such what they call a monoculture. Uh, but there are a lot, so many new varieties that just weren't available back then that I, I think our, our urban forest is going to continue to look pretty fantastic. But you have to be patient. You have to understand the years go by, and yeah. these trees are going to be big someday. And right. so getting right. the idea of having different ages and some that are quite a bit older and then some fresh ones so we uh, don't lose the urban forest all at once is so, so concept. What are, what are some of the species that have been planted uh, that, that we'll be able to walk by and say, hey, I heard Bill Kara say that's a such and such and a so-and-so? Well, uh, there are several species of maple, which are really fantastic street t- trees. If you do look at their uh, website, they have things classified into small stature, medium stature, and tall stature. Uh, but the ones you're talking about, where we're talking about replacing the maple trees, 
Uh, that's where there's plenty of room for a large stature tree. So uh, you've got something, uh, you've got quite a few oaks to choose from. Another one that's coming online pretty good is the Kentucky coffee tree. We do have some beautiful uh, ash trees in Missoula. They're uh, uh, called autumn purple ash. But right now um, in the east, they, the ash trees have been under attack. So hmm. uh, it's recommended not to plant them because there's a concern that this emerald ash borer is going to work its way west and take out a lot of trees and a lot of the, especially urban forests, but it also could hit a lot of our native green ash that are more in eastern Montana. So we've kind of backed away from that, but so far it hasn't made a lot of progress heading this direction, and that's another one that's that's really showing up around town. But there are lindens, and uh, I think I mentioned oaks. Yeah, I was um, going to ask you about oaks because I remember asking you a long time ago uh, about planting oak trees because I didn't see. I, I remember because one of my kids was doing a um, a project for school and uh, gathering leaves and identifying, and we couldn't find a single oak leaf anywhere. And so uh, I I think I asked you or somebody, mm -hmm. why, why don't we have any oaks? And uh, somebody said they just don't grow very well here. Uh, well, that's not exactly true. Um, there are a lot of varieties of oaks, a lot of species of oaks, and uh, some of them do really well here. Probably the one that is the most bulletproof right now is burr oak because uh, it's a native tree to southwestern Montana, although in Bozeman they're developing a few problems with it. But the scarlet oak is, is pretty adaptable. There's another one called swamp white oak. If you get into uh, more common ones that you may have heard of, like pin oak, they're a little more sensitive to soil pH. And we have kind of a high pH uh, in a lot of parts of town, and so it, it causes them to yellow out. It's called chlorosis. And so... But they're also a little more tricky to, to transplant. And so in the old days, they had trouble transplanting oaks uh, compared to some of the maples. And so Missoula is just a maple town. There's just no getting around it. <laughs> but, um, you know, I walk. Oaks in, are the interlopers. <laughs> yeah, as I drive around town and, and walk uh, around town, I'm just constantly looking left and right at what I'm seeing. And I'm seeing more and more species. But I do find a lot of oaks, a lot of fairly mature oaks and uh, some really mature oaks that have been around a long time. So oak is a, is a very usable tree here. And again, you can buy them. They're having been grown in a pot. They transplant a lot better than bare root. And so there's really no issue beyond that as long as you get the right species. I remember uh, we have uh, Dr. Peter Kolb, who is the, uh, a forester. Uh, he does a, a show called the Montana Forestry Minute. And he's been spending the last week or so talking about how environmentally conditions are absolutely prime for these magnificent fall colors that we have. If some, some years they seem a little bit duller, but th this year they're just amazing. Uh, well, that's somewhat true uh, from an ornamental horticultural standpoint, but uh, a lot of it is the new species. Is it really? Being, okay. And the new crosses and the new everything. Uh, uh, some of these varieties are, are just, um, they're, it's genetic, and they're going to, they're, they're just been fantastic additions to our to our whole, um, you know, planting out in Missoula, the trees, the shrubs, that kind of thing. There are just a lot more choices, and uh, so some of them have fantastic features. It could be fall color, it could be berries, it could be flowers, whatever. But we, compared to when I started with my dad 41 years ago, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I've got hundreds more things to choose from. Well, we're talking with Bill Karras from Karras Nursery and Landscape. And again, we, we talk with, with Bill a couple times a year, uh, usually just before spring and then just as fall is, is entering in. Uh, so fall projects, people are, are uh, is it time to dig up the, you know, the, the vegetable garden or is it pretty much all done now or, or, or not being a gar My middle name is Gardner, believe it or not. Yeah, I know that. So, <laughs> uh, are there things that are still waiting to come up? Well, I wouldn't say that's so true. It depends on what you're talking about. But, yeah, it's time to, you know, we're getting frost, and so a lot of the flowers are getting knocked out. A lot of the vegetables are getting knocked out. And so, obviously, you want to clean those up because you don't want to leave it a mess for the winter for a couple reasons. One is, you know, you'll have less insect problems, and the other is it just looks better. Sure. Uh, but beyond that, some things bloom well into fall, and they can take frost. So I think it's something you just have to sort of play by ear a little bit. Um some of the vegetables are very hardy, and, and you can continue to harvest those. But most of the fruiting, veg, what we call fruits, they're, we call them vegetables, but they're really fruits, right. like tomatoes and squash. They won't take much frost, so they're going to be done as soon as they get hit with a hard frost. Now you've got all of these uh, perennials that die back to the ground and ornamental grasses. Are, there are just thousands and thousands in Missoula. 
And usually those uh, perennials, you're going to want to cut back all the way to the ground. On the ornamental grasses, uh, they die back to the ground as well. Uh, you can leave them for the winter because they're kind of pretty, but right. you do want to cut them off first thing in the spring so that all that dead grass above ground doesn't clog up all the new growth. Right. So so my, my wife and I have been going back and forth as to whether we should cut those off after the first frost or or wait until you know, the first, maybe April 1st or April Fool's Day or whatever. Uh, as you had mentioned, you can cut them off in the spring and they'll still pop up, which amazes me. Uh, we have several out in front of our house now. And uh, we cut them down, you know, to about six to eight, six or eight inches. And I thought, they're never going to grow back. And so sure enough, within a few weeks or months, boom, they're just three, four, five feet high again. Yeah, exactly. Well, they, you know, perennials, the definition uh, is that they come back every year, but it implies that they die back to the ground. And uh, so a lot of the perennials, daylilies, peonies, salvia, echinacea, red becky, all of those things are perennials that die back to the ground. And so everything above ground is not alive anyway. So it, just, basically the roots live through the winter. Right. So you can just cut those off. A lot of times you want to cut some of the perennials off before the seeds go all over your garden anyway. <laughs> right. And that can happen with some of the grasses, but the grasses die back to the ground too. The only reason people leave those is sometimes they're very pretty in the winter with frost on them and everything like that. So the fact that they're, they've died back to the ground, they're still pretty. And so you can leave them. But otherwise, you should cut them off in the spring. Well, especially when they when they get that frost on them and they look exactly. Real. It's almost yeah. like having a Christmas decoration. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. So, so let let's talk about uh, pruning. I know that we we have several mature trees in our backyard now, and uh, when is it wise and unwise to prune? Well, uh, let's see here. Let's start. <laughs> let's start with trees. Okay. Um, as far as thinning trees out, I think now is a fine time to do that. Uh, you don't want to usually prune back okay. uh, if you can help it in the uh, in the summer because you'll force a lot of new growth sometime that's susceptible to freezing. But, right. you know, I don't like cutting trees back anyway. I like thinning them and pruning them and, and encouraging the branches that are going the right direction. So that type of tree thinning you could do now, certainly. As far as, uh, like, shrubs, uh, it just depends a little bit. Um, a lot of them are spring blooming, so if you prune them now, you're going to cut off flowers that would be there in the spring. So that's something you may want to wait on. But summer blooming flowers, particularly potentilla and spirea, you know they they don't look like much in the winter, <laughs> and so uh, that's when you can you can prune back because they bloom in the summer on new growth, and rather than on flower buds that are set in the fall. So it just depends on what you're talking about exactly. But certainly things like uh, red twig dogwood, those are fun to enjoy over the winter with the red stems, especially when there's some snow on the ground. So, you know, you can prune those a little bit, but I don't see any reason to cut them way back. Well, we have we have uh, a gnarly old dogwood tree in our backyard, and it, uh, it it's 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 like it's like one of those Halloween monsters with with, the you know, uh, uh, things going everywhere. But. About for about three weeks during the spring and summer, it's got the most beautiful pink flowers, and then they go away, and then it's just a gnarly tree again. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that happens with a lot of our ornamental stuff. Uh, you know, uh, the tall scarlet hawthorn blooms usually in June, uh, and the flowering crab apples in May. Um, mm -hmm. They may be earlier or later some years, but uh, the hawthorn itself, the one I mentioned, that's so popular. It just is a gnarly grower. It <laughs> it just gets all congested in the center and yeah, everything. Yeah. So when, when it's blooming, it's spectacular. And the same kind of with some of the lilacs. They can become like a big shrub. Right. Except when they're blooming, they're spectacular. So, you know, again, those things you have to sort of uh, play by ear. I need to, I'm not sure what you mean by a pink dogwood, honestly. So you might have to bring me a sample. And well, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I, I meant to say a hawthorn tree. Oh, you it, were talking it, about hawthorn. Yeah, it, it was a hawthorn. I'm there sorry. You go. I, I misnamed it. Okay, so. I was yeah, I was yeah. scratching my head a little bit. Yeah. Um yeah, that's one that's a good idea to keep it thinned out and uh and you can create some character to it then, but uh if it's just left to its own devices, right. it can become pretty congested in yeah. the center of the tree. So 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 now would be a good time to go ahead and just kind of very carefully uh, work around uh, up up th from the bottom up to the top or what? That's what I tell people. Prune from the bottom up instead of from the top back because I don't like cutting back trees if at all possible. What you can do is start low and uh, remove any branches that are crossing, that are growing from the outside of the tree back toward the center. 
things are growing up through the center and crossing other branches. You really want all the branches, if possible, to be going up and out. Right. All right. And so you can remove the others. So now, uh, is now a good time to start getting rid of some noxious weeds? I, I, whether, you know, I, I realize we've come a long way in our community in the last 10 years or so about trying to uh, handle noxious weeds, but they're still out there. Spotted knapweed, things like that. Well, in the garden uh, and in the boulevards, we have major problems here uh, with weeds. Yeah. If they're unchecked. Now, Many, many of the weeds we have here are annual weeds, and so they grow from seed and seed that fall, and then they dump their seeds, and then they the rest of them come up in the spring. Right. So some things were too late on. They've gotten too far along, but if at all possible, you want to mow the weeds, pull the weeds before they're able to have their seeds form and ripen. If you catch them when they're still in the green stage, for instance, a lot of times then you don't have that. But you can have one seed produce a plant, and if you let it go all year long, it's going to turn out a thousand seeds, and then that's going to be much more to deal with in the spring. Right. The other thing is, is you know, we talk about northern maples. Well, they put out a seed that sometimes grows in the garden, and very quickly, uh, and all of a sudden, after about three years, you've got a <laughs> small tree, a grove. <laughs> you can't pull. You can pull them easily when right. they first germinate. But our right. biggest problem, as far as trees go, is definitely what's called the Siberian elm, and they are all over town. And they seed in everywhere. Is that what we call a trash tree? It would be, uh, yeah, I would call it a trash tree, I guess. Um, the uh, they're, I, I call them volunteers because they just grow wherever they want. Uh, but they are a big problem because, again, they germinate and maybe grow five feet the first year or three feet. And then the next year they're 10 feet tall. And you can't pull them out anymore right. uh, very easily. Right. And so that's one I'm always telling people, keep an eye out for them because they, they grow along foundations. Now, what, what, what do they look like? Describe well, them. they have a fairly small leaf. Um, it's um, just a kind of a typical uh, uh, leaf shape, but it's not very large. There's a bunch of them uh, lining the old Fort Road. Okay. If somebody wanted to go look at them. But otherwise, I see them all over the place, and a lot of times people don't recognize what they are, and so they just, uh, you know, don't look twice. It just looks like a pretty innocuous shrub, but it right. turns out in a few years it takes over. Very prolific. Now, what about Russian olive? Is, is that also another trash tree? Well, Russian olive, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's sort of been made illegal in Montana. Oh, okay. It's not terrible problem in Missoula in terms of naturalizing, but other parts of the state, it has kind of seeded in and naturalized and, and caused some problems as far as the native stuff. So, so like, we don't even sell those. Right. Um, so, so some people have them and if they keep them under control, they are a nice contrast tree because they have that gray leaf. So sometimes when, when I, I, I have a friend who I help uh, mow their yard every now and then, and if it's, if it's gotten a little bit too high, I'll notice what looks like a small shrub beginning to grow out. And of course, I'll cut it down. Uh, is that exactly what you're talking about? They just kind of uh, go wherever the seeds fall and up they come. Well, in that case, it's probably coming up from the roots. Uh, it's probably either a choke cherry. Uh, there are several kinds, inc- including a really popular tree called a Canada red cherry or Schubert cherry. Could also be aspen uh, coming up from the roots. So trees that sucker up from the roots and come up in the lawn, a lot of poplars do that too. Mm-hmm. That's a real battle. There isn't a whole lot you can do to discourage that. Just except keep cutting keep them down. Mode. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, all right. So, believe it or not, we only have like uh, six or seven minutes left in our program. So, we haven't even gotten it to anywhere near the Christmas story. I know it's not yeah. our Christmas show yet, but yeah. uh, well, we got fall bulbs to talk about. Oh, too. let's talk about fall bulbs. Let's do that. Well, now's the time to plant. Uh, I, I joke about the fall bulbs, uh, which include tulips, daffodils, crocus, hyacinth, and a number of other. Uh, lesser known bulbs like grape hyacinths and scylla and snowdrops and there's a bunch of them uh, but uh, tulips daffodils crocus hyacinth are the are the really well known ones and now's the time to plant those but I joke about it because in our society we are instant gratification right right and you don't get that out of fall bulbs you <laughs> you plant and then you wait until spring um, so uh, but now's the time to plant all of those things that everyone's heard of. If you're going to ask me about deer, I'm going to answer it right now, which is um, <laughs> the best two would be the uh, daffodils. And then we have a whole new thing that hasn't been available uh, in the distant past called ornamental onion or allium. And uh, they're quite deer resistant too. And they produce these uh, medium or even large, totally round balls of purple, 
pink, white. They're spectacular, and they're a really nice addition to the garden. So daffodils and allium slash ornamental onions would be the deer-resistant ones, but all of them are, are just fantastic, and it's really fun when they come up in the spring and you've kind of forgotten about them. I, I'm going to display my rank ignorance here, but I've always wondered, uh, is it possible to plant a bulb wrong uh, so that it won't come up through the ground? It'll try to go down to the center of the <laughs> I know that sounds like a silly, stupid deal, but uh, is is there a method of planting bulbs so you make sure they come up? Because I see all these rows and rows of beautiful tulips that are straight, and like like soldiers in line, and others are just all over the place. Well, uh, you know, I think you want to do them right side up, but they'll <laughs> they they will find up they'll find anyway. a way, right? They'll find up anyway. So you right. can usually tell, like with a tulip, the pointed part goes up, and right. you can even see some roots coming off of daffodils and and that kind of thing so normally you can tell pretty easily but they actually they know what is up so they will even grow around and try and come up uh do a 180 and try and come up so you know plants so, somebody amazing. had to ask and i guess yeah. it was me yeah <laughs> you know the main trick i think on bulbs is try and make sure they're in good loose soil right they have to push through all of that so how, how deep should you or, or does it depend on the bulb how it deep depends you, on the bulb i always tell people two and a half maybe even three times the height of the bulb deep and uh, so that's just sort of a general rule of thumb so crocus aren't going to go very deep and daffodils might grow go five inches deep or something like that five or six inches deep so it's going to defend depend a little bit on the size of the bulb but that's just sort of a rule of thumb and uh plants you know are so resilient you know a tree will fall over and it'll start growing it'll grow nevertheless as long as its roots are still attached someplace but it'll grow straight up which is sideways when it was standing, and, <laughs> right, uh, right? Bulbs are the same way; they they know what direction is up. So. Yeah. Well, it, one thing that you and I spoke about before we started recording was these absolutely glorious poppies that are uh, along Miller Creek Road and uh, the Upper Miller Creek area. That every, every spring they pop up and they're just beautiful to look at. And about three or four weeks later, they're all gone. So I, I was wondering, are those bulbs or seeds? Well, you normally you plant that uh, Oriental poppy; they they call it. Um, you would plant it from a plant, but you can do it from seed. Uh, I'm, I'm not aware of uh, any other form that you can get a hold of it besides seeds and plants. Because I know we went, we went to your place. Uh, my wife and I went because we wanted to buy some so we could plant them because we just thought they're so beautiful. And I said, probably let let's wait till spring and you can plant those and they'll come up. Yes, right. uh, they're quite uh, persistent in the garden. Uh, they'll come back every year, and they're like the perennials we talked about before. You just cut them back at the end of the season. They will keep blooming, and if you don't want them to seed around, you can just cut off the flower heads, and you can leave the foliage until until it dies back in the fall. And it's just one of hundreds of perennials that grow here. But that one is a real eye catcher when it does pop oh, up they, in a pasture. They are or magnificent. Blooming, yeah. Uh, okay. Now, but they have about a minute and a half left, so let's talk real quick about lawns. Uh, what what should we do to prepare our lawn for the winter? Well, I don't think there's a lot to worry about. I, you know, I would mow it so it's not too terribly long. I wouldn't, I wouldn't scalp it by any means, though. But I, I would mow it, uh, you know, medium height, a couple inches maybe, and and uh, clean it up as well as you can so you have good air circulation. Uh, you can fertilize this time of year. I would use an organic fertilizer if you want to. Otherwise, I think you really probably can wait till spring. And uh, that's about it for lawns. They're pretty resilient. Sure, and I know you're you're still busy doing landscaping. We'll be landscaping uh, through October and into November. When the ground freezes, it kind of puts a kibosh on things. But. Okay, so, so we, we just need some <laughs> contact information. We need uh, a location, phone number, website, things like that. Okay, well, we're at karisnursery.com. We're located on 3rd Street at 2727 South 3rd, two blocks west of Reserve, where we've been for over 100 years. And our phone number is 543-3333. I was going to let you say that. Bill, it's always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you, Peter. Uh, fountain of information, and uh, we appreciate it. And uh, you've been a, such a wonderful part of this community for so many years. And we uh, just hang around for a while, yeah, okay? Back at you. All right. <laughs> That's going to do it for Missoula Real Estate Today. We will see you next week right here. Thanks for right. tuning into Missoula Real Estate Today. We hope you found the information over the last 30 minutes to be helpful. If you have any suggested topics for future Missoula Real Estate Today programs or any questions about buying or selling real estate, please email Diane. Here's the address. It's Diane Beck at Realtor.com. That's Diane Beck at Realtor.com. We'll see you next week on Newstalk KGBO.com.
98.3 FM and 1290 AM.